Dr. Chuck to leave the front of the podium here, basically. But so, thank you all for coming today. Um, does everybody know what accessibility is? Right? You can't see it. All right. So um, we're trying to not get sued, right? But we're also trying to do more than just not get sued. So the point of this talk is that I started to notice. I started to become concerned about the fact that pretty much everything seemed to be framed around like, what's the minimum we need to do so we don't get sued? And that's not really the point of accessibility. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I started to make some weird stuff. Um, if you want to see some of the things in action, if you go to elmsln.org, um, look for the link that says Open Olmus and what is XAPI. Now that's a, a site about XAPI, but there's a little accessibility uh, logo in the corner, you can click it and you can play around with the things that I'm going to play around with in these videos. So extremely brief background, um, we're building an NGDLE, a platform for it, so the platform is actually self-federated, different parts of the platform never assume the other parts are there, so everything's web services, which just means we get into weird stuff. Like we have this weird stuff factory, basically, and so I abuse that fact a lot to make other cool weird stuff. and so. These are three mini talks, if you will, um, about accessibility. So the first is increasing accessible empathy. And so the desired outcome of this was we want to increase the accessibility options through user preference, um, but then we also want to increase empathy for uh, people of different conditions through simulation. Um, I've seen, you know, a lot of sites will have like the make the text bigger. And like, that's not bad, but my users aren't gonna go like realize why they need why someone would need to make the text bigger or that someone has a visual impairment or whatever that thing is as to why they're using those options. So I wanted to add that in. So I went looking for some things. Um, one thing I found that was useful in this was uh, Open Dyslexic. So Open Dyslexic is an open source font um, that was made with people with dyslexia in mind and so it kind of tweaks the arcs of all the and pitches of the letters so it's hopefully easier to read. So play little video here but so if you go to that site you can click and open our preferences and see we have some kind of more traditional things right like make the interface bigger or make it smaller uh, but then we have high contrast mode which is using CSS and JavaScript to do it we have color inverting right which is kind of the turn the lights out which flips everything uh, we have disabling interface animations which can help with people that have like visual jerkiness right there's the um, uh, open dyslexic font applied and we're gonna ignore that label and that label for the next one. Uh, then we have simulators, and this is able to simulate every form of um, color blindness. Uh, so you don't have to run your images through something, you just do it live. Uh, it's an SVG filter. Uh, we can also simulate field loss, whether it's peripheral or it's like glaucoma in nature. And then there's also the, and I have to click it again because I know how the video works. There's also a dyslexia simulator, and I've been told this is not what dyslexia is really like, but the point is to try and get people to even realize like what the heck dyslexia is, right? That letters are basically so wavy that you can't really perceive them type of a thing. Um, and so that's just a JavaScript. All of these are like JavaScript libraries. Um, if you're interested more in what those actually are, come talk to me. And so some, some places you can get more information about this, A11Y, uh, which someone told me that's because accessibility is 11 characters long. It took like three years for me to realize that. But a11yproject.com has some good resources and blog posts. Um, Drupal.org slash project slash a11y is the Drupal module for that stuff. Not that a lot of Sakai people would care, but the, the JavaScript code is there, right? It's just JavaScript that's doing that stuff. There's nothing magic there. Um, and then I also did you know some blog posts. These slides are available online. Um, so the next, next one is uh, Jarvis make me a coffee. And so um, the desired outcome is I want to talk to the browser and I want to have the browser talk back and I don't want any other middleware in between. I don't want some people to have this dumb Alexa do whatever thing or Google Home or whatever the new Apple one that's literally a rip off of those other ones is. Um, I just want people to talk to the browser. And so like to make this, right? Jarvis. So is this even possible? Well, it turns out sort of. So there's um, speech recognition API, which you can see has coverage in Chrome and Opera, and there's some flags you can turn on in Firefox to, to enable this. So right now, the ability to recognize your speech and give a confidence score, granted it ships that out to a third-party service, like, but it is built into the browser, it's kind of neat. 
On the other side, as far as the browser talking back to you, there's pretty good coverage already via speech synthesis API. Um, and so you don't need a screen reader to actually read this stuff. You could actually just have the browser start saying things. Now it's in the incredibly obnoxious robot voice, but like that's better than nothing. Um, so I found a library, obviously, in, in Drupal land there's a module for that, but in JavaScript there's a library that someone just invented while I was giving this talk for that. And so Anyang is that library. Um, so if you search for Anyang, it's a neat little JavaScript library that just streamlines, much, much like jQuery streamlines some calls for JavaScript, I'd say that this is the equivalent but for voice commands. Um, as far as a Drupal integration, the way that we end up getting new commands in is we allow people to say, basically define what that is. So it would look like, hey, the, the key phrase, right, because you want a trigger word basically, and then, you know, play video or word count or where am I or whatever that phrase is, which then we have, uh, have a JavaScript callback. So then what a JavaScript callback looks like is basically, hey, uh, whenever we match that key phrase, then I need you to say whatever. And that's how we can have this kind of very dumb two-way conversation. And so, showing this. Scroll. Next page. Next page. Previous page. Back. Forward. Hey, Elms. Anything I can do for you, admin? <laughs> Open preferences. Alternate formats. Open speed reader. Speed reader play. Close. Next page. Scroll. Read to me. Since this week will likely involve a fair amount of waiting Stop. for people to... Elms, what is lecture? From Wikipedia colon a lecture, from the French, lecture, meaning reading, process, is an oral presentation intended to present information or teach people Stop. about a particular subject, for example by a university or college Stop. teacher. Le right? So, I, le I left that part in there because it took like five recordings to make that happen. It took like five recordings to make that happen flawlessly, right? And then even at the end it did. Um, so. You had to have headsets because it starts talking and it's picking up its own voice, basically. So then I'm saying stop into a, a earpiece at first, but then I unplugged it later to make it, right? So there are some issues with this approach as we have it currently. Um, this is in hands-free mode. There is push the keyboard keys and then it activates and then you can talk, right? Which is probably what you want as opposed to the creepy NSA spyware that I just demoed. Um, so there is a uh, HTML cookie that we can set on an Elms domain, and then every site you go to is voice capable in that way. So then I can say, hey, go to the media system, and it knows, and it's just listening all the time. So I actually have it disabled in the background because one presentation I was giving this, it started just talking because it was answering the phrases that I was doing. Um, but that was neat, but it wasn't actually the goal of the project. Um, so this was. Make coffee. Why don't you get me a coffee? I do all the hard work anyway. I'll have a venti americano with six shots of espresso. It was a rough night last night processing all those rosters. So, I obviously have to have some snark if it's going to be Jarvis. Um, so, <clears throat> if you're interested in, in the projects that build that, uh, there's Voice Commander, which is a module in Drupal that we added all this functionality into. So basically we can wire up any Drupal site in like five minutes uh, with commands in general. Obviously I put in very Elm specific commands like connotations of going forward and back. Um, it also, really what it's doing at a technical level is it's looking for a data hyphen voice command attribute. And so then I just style all links to have that attribute and then print the name of what the title of the link is into it. So then if there's a link on the page that says you know, New York Times, I could say, go to New York Times, and it would skim off, see that, oh, and then send you there by clicking it. It's basically a glorified click the link, which the links are triggering stuff. Um, and then there's a blog post about how to turn your Drupal site into Google Home, which the Wikipedia query thing is actually processing your voice, shipping it internal to Elms, and then sending it out the door to Wikipedia, seeing if an article matched, bringing it back, and then triggering the speech, uh, the, the talking part of it. Um, so this last 
last little talk here is the end of the inaccessible web as we all built it. Um, so I would argue HTML basically allows for the conditions by which all of us then get sued. Um, because they set up, much like uh, if anyone's implemented MySQL, uh, MySQL has these awesome performance settings that uh, aren't implemented by default because they, by policy, implement the thing that was the norm in like 1992. So then the first thing you have to do is go and actually make it more optimized and then everyone does the same thing. But so basically that's what I perceive we're all doing with our HTML, right? Like an image should be accessible by default but instead, they put in the wiring of, well, add alt data and add this or a link and, oh, well, tab index equals negative one. Are you going to really teach your users how to do correct tab index when they're adding, like, custom links and elements to pages? Even if I could, they're going to screw it up or I'm going to screw it up. So I don't want that to be a thing anymore. So basically, uh, the desired outcome is to streamline design workflows and incentivize people to use well-designed attributes that are accessible by default and can't be made inaccessible. And so they're using the elements that make their things look pretty and they're accessible, but we're not teaching them about accessibility. My goal is that they, no one should have to know what accessibility is, just everything should work that way with obvious extreme scenarios like, yes, you need you know, captioning on video, stuff like that, right? Um, and so... I also want people to be able to make things that look very professional without any knowledge of CSS or JavaScript. Uh, so in other words, save ed tech. Uh, but what are we saving ed tech from and how? So we're saving it from reality, gang. Uh, the reality is every 20 something that comes out of college or skips college and is working in their garage wants to do things in JavaScript frameworks. So it's a fun joke to be like, hey, there's new JavaScript frameworks that exist right now, but those people are getting hired elsewhere to work on other things that are really cool and flashy. And so we need to make our ecosystems very cool and flashy to attract those people back. Otherwise, you're going to get a dozen talks about how cool Golang is, but they're going to happen at other conferences forever. Um, weird, like Java and PHP just aren't fun anymore. But uh, so user and student expectations of quality are also off the charts, right? If something, <laughs> we get emails about like a button might not have loaded because you're in some geographic zone and that becomes what used to be semi-acceptable, like, hey, like something's up, uh, I know I have problems sometimes, to I am a paying customer, I put all this money down for this online course, why the hell isn't this working? Which is totally understandable. Um, and so, yeah, that's the part about getting sued. But so let's get escape from reality to how we're going to solve this. And uh, if anyone's been started making fun of me in every talk, I've mentioned web components. So guess what? There's going to be a talk of web components in this one. Uh, but if you go to webcomponents.org, I feel what is going on there is the solution um, or a big part of it. So web components is a horrible name because you go, oh, yeah, the stuff that makes up the web. Well, it is actually a specification. So what are web components? Web components are a set of web platform APIs that allow you to create new, custom, reusable HTML elements. Basically, you can define your own HTML. And when you're defining HTML, you're building it out of HTML. So even if that's printing five divs in a consistent pattern, you've now had one element that prints five divs in a consistent pattern. Uh, this is not Pattern Lab. It's very similar, if you're familiar with Pattern Lab. The methodology is similar, right, that you should follow principles of atomic design. But this is a much more browser layer at, uh, way of attacking this. And it is actually a specification of the browser. There's four parts to it. There's templates, uh, custom elements, shadow DOM, and imports. And any browser that implements these four specifications technically is implementing web components like because web components is then the meta, basically. Um, templates is basically just that the browser can, uh, what is it, custom, templates is that you can have areas that use a template tag. I don't understand why that's important. Um, the custom elements part is that the browser can register and understand custom elements. So forever, if you would write like dr-chuck, hyphen bio as an HTML tag, it would just be like, yeah, that's a div. I don't know what the hell that is. So we're, the browser needs to be able to register and go, oh yeah, I know what that is. Um, Shadow DOM is basically that you can render things in a vacuum and then more or less paint them on the screen. And so you get 
instead of bleed through from all these different CSS frameworks where we go and implement Bootstrap or we implement Materialize or whatever, and then it conflicts with that one file that we just put in and go, right, uh, import or important, and just start stacking important tags on everything. <laughs> Um, this allows you to basically, the browser will render it kind of in a vacuum and then go, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like and put it there. Um, it's kind of segregating the DOM into shadow DOM, beneath the scenes, and light DOM, which is what people normally see. Um, and then imports, which is basically just that HTML files can import other HTML files and then knows how to resolve those. So you could have jQuery stuffed in an HTML file that then that one HTML file just has the SRC and it loads jQuery, but if you have 10 other files all referencing that, what, what's the phrase, deduping? So just deduping as I was schooled the other day? Okay. Um, now you're gonna also see me throw around the word Polymer um, and see it come up a lot in Web Components land. Polymer, if you, if you think of like a thin tooling layer just above the browser spec to make it faster to implement the browser spec. That's basically Polymer. So you don't have to use Polymer in order to build web components. It's just Google really pushed for this to be a thing with WC3 and they've been supporting this for a while and they've made incredible tooling that makes it really easy to get up to speed quickly. So there are other frameworks. There's uh, something called Skate.js and there's another one I believe called Xtags. Um, which is by Mozilla. And more or less the major difference between them is just the way at which you declare things. I don't, having played with those, I just don't like them as much, but the end result is you will be able to build custom elements. Um, they have a little bit more backwards compatibility in the other frameworks than Polymer. Polymer is basically saying, I don't really give a crap if you use IE less than 10, um, you don't exist. So it's something to be, uh, consider. but. Has anyone seen the new Google Earth? Well, you should check it out because it's entirely web-based if you go to earth.google.com and it's entirely built in Polymer. Um, now, they cheat a bit because obviously you can't do advanced 3D flybys and things when in pure HTML, so they have some weird C processing thing on your computer, which means your computer is going to more or less overheat if you use this site for too long. Um, but. Um, them actually eating their own dog food is if you go to youtube.com slash new, uh, that will be like, hey, there's a new thing here and would you like to check it out? And if you hit yes, then it will reload YouTube entirely in web components. And the important thing is you won't notice the difference. That's kind of what they're, they're going for at the moment. It's a developer preview, so like there's a few edge cases where things aren't perfect, but if you right click and inspect, you'll see these U hyphen tube and YTD hyphen tags all over the place, and those are polymer elements. So let's take an example uh, of where, I, where we would want to use these. So let's say we have this awesome explosion, and uh, forever, if you as a faculty member wanted to put in this awesome explosion, because you're talking about combustion or whatever topic, um, you would make an IMG SRC equals awesome explosion dot GIF, alt metadata, blah, blah, blah. But let's say that you just you use a lot of explosions, like this is some sweet uh, MySpace site you're trying to make, basically. Um, and so you've got awesome explosions everywhere. Well, you would define an awesome explosion tag. And then you could start to define your own properties on that, so that instead of your users writing awesome explosion and then style uh, font size 40 rem width 100 or whatever, they could just say tiny, small, big, epic. Um, and then let's say of color, right? So we could add additional properties. So in this, we're defining our own specification basically, which is where this is different from Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab is much more like there are atoms and then there are molecules and then there are templates and so on. This is more of, well, you're defining, that's, that's great. You're making something in those buckets, but then you're also making your own API for how to get data in and out of those buckets or how to visualize those buckets. And so one really, look, so where does this relate to accessibility, right? Is um, Rob Dodson does uh, a, po a podcast called Polycast um, and talks a lot about Polymer and web component development, but uh, I believe he spends half an hour talking about the accessibility considerations of a single checkbox on the page. And the point of it is like at the end, like, so you're gonna do all that, right? No, nobody is. 
no one should have to ever again. So what we did is we made an element. And so then if you implement, there's paper hyphen checkbox, you get a checkbox that can it respects tab order correctly when in place with lots of other checkboxes and does a nice little background highlighting so you don't have to do your crappy outline that all of us have tried to implement to make sure you can do tab order and see it correctly and then also puts in place the semi obnoxious at times material design ripple so that when you tap it you see like a burst to indicate that you've placed your thumb there or whatever um, so we could do this as well, right? Making these elements that are accessible by default and really cool looking uh, to incentivize our users to use them. So in this, this minor example run through here, um, we've got one called LRN design hyphen drawer. And so the point of this would be a, a button I click and it flies out an off canvas widget that shows stuff. There's tons of accessibility considerations associated with that. I need to make the button be able to have tab order correctly. I need it to be focusable. I need people to understand what it is because it might just be an icon. In this case, it will be. I need them, once they click, to then change the focus to be inside of that panel. I need to be able to hit escape and leave that but not keep my focus in the off canvas. And so all that can be bundled up into one tag. The other fun thing is because now you're basically creating this by reference pattern for yourself. So let's say all those considerations are there, but I screwed up. I screwed up. I know it doesn't happen, right, Dr. Chuck? But so I screwed something up royally, and that isn't accessible. But we've started to roll it out into production all over the place, and people are implementing this. And in the old world, if they were copying and pasting blocks of HTML, uh, you're in a lot of trouble. But in the new world, we go, oh, well, we'll just update the root element. And you update the root element, and now every place that that's been implemented is accessible now um, via the HTML imports thing, which we can show some code if people want to see that. But so what we get with this LRN design drawer is I get a button that then I can tab to and see it. That if I hover it over, I get this nice, slick little, hey, here's what this will do, alt type of information. That when I click it, it flies open and presents the information that's inside of it that has the escape key type of triggering and all of that. So there's got to be a drawback, right? All of this stuff sounds way too good. And so there kind of is. Uh, you can't use Netscape Navigator 3.0. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and you can't use really old versions of IE. Now, this was why I wasn't really talking about this like two months ago. Um, and then I went to DrupalCon and met some people from uh, that worked in government because government gov space is huge with Drupal, and we were talking. I was showing them Polymer and stuff. And I was like, "Yeah, I mean, my concern is you know browser support because obviously at the federal government has to support every browser that comes in, right?" No, this is the only positive thing that came out of Heartbleed. Does anyone know what Heartbleed was? So Heartbleed basically is the first time I can think of where there was a mass exodus where all sysops and sysadmins said, uh, these browsers before this date, hell no. And so all your crappy versions of IE went away overnight. Yes, tons of things got hacked and that's unfortunate. But so really the, um, in looking at some of their analytics, um, there were only I think less than 1% of traffic that would not have gotten the page delivered the correct way. Now, 1% of a billion is still a lot. I'm not saying that it's not, but so I think the, the thing with web components is if you're in an environment that's a regimented space, which at least for us, that's LMS land and that's edu higher education, where a lot of times we can say, you know, here are the requirements, right? You might not use these for a public website. Uh, if you are and you plan to use them for a public website, you're going to have to have a failover strategy, right? So that you have, uh, maybe that's your old site. So I would say this is a great technology to look at when you're going to build the next thing or to start doing progressive enhancement within a project you already have. Um, why I'm even saying that is because if you look at anything that the Polymer team says, they're in this Silicon Valley Google world where it's like, well, yeah, just throw out everything you've ever done and do this tomorrow. Your shopping cart app's going to look... Uh, uh, I'm not building a shopping cart app from the ground up, but I mean, that's amazing that you can do it and literally run one command and have a shopping cart. But um, so what are the pros of this approach? 
Um, separation of concerns, uh, unidirectional data flow, it's a component architecture. If you use Polymer, it's self-documenting. So as you build, you're building your element, you are actually building a documentation site, which is also really useful. And that last one is the thing that I actually am here to not shut up about, which is framework interoperability. <laughs> so framework interoperability would suggest that we could have, all of our systems are already in this gang. So we all use divs. Right? We all use body tags and HTML tags in all of our systems. So if we all made HTML elements that all of us can use, then we could use them in all of our systems instead of the five plus talks that I've seen about uh, React versus Angular versus Vue.js versus we're gonna do this in Material versus Sakai implemented Bootstrap versus oh, what, how should we do a style guide versus these are all incredibly important conversations to have, but this is a technology that can kind of be that playing field leveler, right? So that everybody goes, okay, but the way we're going to accomplish that visually is, or hey, if we're gonna make buttons, why don't we all just use the same damn button? Or if we're gonna communicate assignments, can we try and at least standardize the way we talk about assignments? Because my larger you know, <clears throat> mission with that is then these guys come on board. So you're not gonna get Generally speaking, I can see there's a lot of Drupal people in the room. You're not going to get Drupal people in this room. And you might, for historical reasons, be like, why the hell do I care? Well, it's a really advanced technical conference, and those people are making really cool stuff. It would be awesome to have those people in the room to pick their brains about things or to borrow code from them from these other open source libraries. But if, especially if you can get something like WordPress, which powers like 20 or 30% of the web and get developers from there. Granted, yes, uh, argument, there aren't really any WordPress developers. But um, you, we can finally start to have that playing field, not just be uh, losing efforts in like, hey, I made this awesome, incredible, slick Angular app. Uh, let me do a talk about it. Oh, can I, can I pick it apart and do it? Well, you, well yeah, you can use exactly that, what the Angular app does. Awesome, so I, I have to then just follow all of your techniques and do the exact same thing over again and reinvent the wheel basically so that I can learn how to do Angular which may or may not be cool five years from now and then there aren't any 20 somethings to do it, sweet. Uh, so we've started working on an ontology document um, over the last several months and working on elements. So we actually have about 40 or so elements that are in this LRN space. And the idea with LRNs is that we have some, a way of communicating educational concepts uh, and design concepts and the way at which we build whole applications uh, via these tags. And so I think you need to see some of the tags so that you go, okay, cool, how does these work? But uh, I'm gonna go to a few of those now. If I can go to a website. So, um, can anyone tell where the web components are? It's a good first exercise. Any guesses? No, that's the point. Okay, but this one I think sticks out like a sore thumb. So this is actually something called paper avatar. And paper avatar is wrapped in an LRN design avatar tag. And so if I pass an LRN design avatar tag, a label, uh, let's say Dr. Chuck, it is a Genticon, or a Jdenticon, or whatever the stupid label is, in which it's turning the word into a mathematical hash and then generating a cool fractal icon out of it. So that took about 40 seconds to develop um, because I was able to take paper avatar, and paper avatar, as we can see, is just made up of div tags and SVGs, and paper avatar uses its own API to go, hey, what data came into me? Oh, I'm going to pass this to this uh, jdenticon service thing, and oh, there we go. There's our function to turn it into that. So we can kind of start progressively enhancing our systems in place. If you notice when I click, it does this ripple effect. Well, the, that's because this is actually not a normal HTML button. It's a paper button, and paper button uh, is something you put inside of a tags, and then you're supposed to tell the a tag, hey, you don't have a tab index, which is a little weird, right? You want people to tab to those, but the paper button is then in charge of that. And so then if I, oops, if I'm not tabbing in the code part of it, that would be nice. All right, so we go over to there, and I click, All right, I've got my, that's another paper button. We've got, if we, we're starting to progressively decouple our way out of these solutions that I used to sit there and manually massage and, and do all of this stuff, but wiring these things up with uh, paper buttons 
just for the bloop and whatever uh, was very easy, even for the little hover state. All right, let's take something far more sophisticated. So this is our traditional, like this is just a dumping ground of stuff. But so this would be like what a, a page of instruction looks like. And I click it, it was sweet, there's a paper button and it had that nice little elevated thing and it was accessible, sweet. I got people to use that paper button because of that, don't care. Um, what I actually care about is you just keep stacking elements on top of each other, just like normal HTML. So the way you build applications in this is you just have single tags at the end of the day. And then you tell that single tag, hey, go get data from somewhere. And we can unpack what one of these is if anyone actually wants to see them, but you can basically build this. So I was clicking before and that was actually going through different pages. This is now a single tag that is made up of other tags, yes, that's making a J an Ajax call to Elms saying, hey, what's the next page? 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 This takes load time from two to 500 milliseconds down to 63, even in local development, just because, and, and this isn't even fully implementing everything, right? The other neat thing is because of the fact that there are components coming across, but your browser already has the component definition loaded, this sticky note looking thing is actually another web component. And this sticky note, you can see, is paper material. It has this tax thing I won't necessarily get into at the moment. And then there's LRN design panel card. And so panel card says, hey, just make it look like a little note card that's floating there. Um, but if you plug in a title, did you know, or whatever, I can actually edit the DOM and see the change reflected in the element immediately, just like I would expect normally. But what that is updating, is not just updating that word, I've had my users be able to put in title, but they're actually creating an H3 tag. And so now I'm able to ensure correct document order because they're not using, the idea would be they're not using headings anymore. And we're not expressing things in headings, we're expressing things in visual concepts. Well, let's go a step higher. I don't, I've been trying to drill into the IDs like, okay, uh, uh, I want a table. Why? What is the table serving? Is it to present data? No, well, no, I just like the way it's laid out. <clears throat> We're never doing that again, right? So we said, okay, well, it's, it's, I want a sticky note. No, you don't want a sticky note. What is the purpose of this thing? And we said, oh, well, it's some extra material or it's, hey, make sure you pay attention to, right? It's like an alert type of a thing. I said, okay, well, that's called on a side. That's not the primary material. Said, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So we have an LRN aside tag and then the LRN aside tag has very minimal styling to it, right, to say whether or not this is sticky. So if I scroll past it, see it affixes to the interface. Um, but it has that what did you know title information in it, which I then took that design element and stuffed it inside a pedagogically focused element. So the idea is we would have our IDs and our faculty using, you know, if you used a CK editor template button, right, because we're trying to bridge to this new world. If you used a CK editor template button and I clicked on one of those things in there and I put in a template, it wouldn't put in a normal div, 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 div template. It would put in something that's pedagogically focused. But what we're also doing via incentivizing that design, they go, oh, I'd like it to look like whatever, but what they just did is they programmed the page as learning objects. So I could run a query after we've got a whole bunch of content built out of this and know what all the asides are and know what all the primary material is. There's an incredible amount of potential to this technology if we talk through what we want our way of expressing these concepts online to be. Uh, if you want to see webcomponents.org, you can search for LRN, see that we've got a whole bunch of them. Um, we're starting to basically reroute all development efforts of everyone involved with Elms to just be doing Polymer. We're not doing Drupal anymore. Um, not to say they're not interfacing with Drupal, but we're not interfacing with Drupal's theme layer. So every app we're making is a headless one-page app, basically. Every little designed component that someone would implement is its own island that we can make sure looks the right way no matter where it is. So in the case of that panel card, I can go to webcomponents.org, 
find an LRN design panel card. If I want to download it and use it, and that licensing thing, don't, don't look at that because that's actually going to change to Apache 2 because I was told that Apache 2 would mean these could run in Sakai and everywhere else a lot, hell of a lot smoother, and I'm allowed to do that, I told. So I would copy this, I would run Bower, and I would pull in the dependencies for it. I could go to this mini doc site, and the mini doc site is actually generated by, this is where Polymer comes into play. This is the Polymer tooling. You run a command, and it generates this microsite for you. Um, so I could have, I could send this to someone and be like, well, you know, if you, if you really want to implement the panel card, it has an elevation, it has text color, title, et cetera. Uh, here's a demo of what it looks like. Cool. So the other thing with this is um, in, in the quest to kill HTML, is so we have uh, this new language basically these new html that we can form and we make it accessible and we make it well designed so people actually use it and then they don't have to think about the accessibility side but they've implemented it by default why are we having them copy and paste stuff into WYSIWYG editors right that's where all the accessibility issues come up um, as my front end person Michael Potter always says the battle for the body field you could do a great amount of work in the the rest of your theme layer or whatever but as soon as you let someone make their own HTML you've lost the war because that's where they can screw things up no one is intentionally screwing things up gang right this is just gonna happen it doesn't matter how much training you have so if we can make these elements that look good and they're expressing their pedagogical purpose. And if you've seen or heard of any of the OER schema stuff that, that we've been rambling about a little bit as well, maybe we wire that metadata into our tag structure as well. So the things you're defining actually have OER schema metadata attached to them, but you don't know that. Why do we need an authoring experience somewhere else? So the element knows how to handle its properties. Why don't we just teach it how to edit itself. And so because it's just tags that are inside other tags, we made a series of tags called hacks. And hacks is short for headless authoring experience. And the vision with hacks is that any element wired for hacks would know how to modify itself and emit an event to something. Doesn't, it's not choosy about what that something is. Emit an event to something to say, hey, I got updated. And so we can start making our elements that people put in place, use our internal permission systems to be self-manipulatable, right? So I can modify these, or I could wire it up to other elements. So this is an element that does color picking and is an accessible color picker. And I go, I want the background of this to be red. And we could start to put in criteria to go, and I don't swear it leads off from that, to force things to be accessible. Well, right now I can modify text color. Right, so I would need that contrast ratio. But if we're already being notified of the background color change and we know the class that's used because it's like red hyphen dark four or whatever, we can mathematically figure out what the best way to present that and legal way from an accessibility perspective and just automatically seed the color of the text. So little things like that that we can start to wire into the element itself, not oh, how are we gonna put this into a WYSIWYG editor? Oh, CK editor adopted this new thing and now it's slightly better. It doesn't actually solve the problem. Uh, we go right to the elements and do it and then we incentivize people to use them through good design. So in this case, there's an elevation. The paper spec, paper comes from material. I know it's this cute acronym, hell without Google at times, but so it has elevation. So I could say, oh, I want that to be elevation depth of five. And now it makes it look like it's raised off the interface more, but really all it did was switch that variable of the class to say, hey, your elevation's five now instead of four. Um, we can start doing this in our aside example then, or if we had an LRN assignment, or if we had an LRN vocabulary word, or if we had an LRN application hyphen content player, or whatever the thing is, we can keep making these elements that wire all of this stuff in. So then if I have an aside, as an example from before, the aside being told to present itself, in this case, as a panel card, is inheriting the properties of the panel card, and the panel card knows how to edit itself. So now that means my LRN aside basically knows how to edit itself which is a pedagogical concept as opposed to the visual one. So 
Uh, I'm going to leave it off right about there, um, other than going to the hacks manager real quick as far as what we want, what we're trying to build with these components to make a more accessible editor would be that you would put your page into a state to indicate that it's being edited because someone has permission to do it, and then you would just reach out and actually edit it. And you would have a library of elements to choose from, which are pedagogically focused for producing that content. Yes, it could just be I need a paragraph of text, obviously, <laughs> but that I could then say, oh yeah, throw in a block quote, and then the block quote, because of the hacks system, knows, oh, well, these are my properties. You can modify me in such and such a way. Maybe there's the ability to decorate that stuff. Yeah, we're going to save that back to there. Open up that. Throw in a panel card. Oh, over in this paragraph, uh, we could throw in this other card. We could throw in an avatar and present it that way, a block of content. Whatever the thing is that we're actually using, reaching out and touching the DOM if the user has access to it and leveraging the capabilities of the browser, not leveraging JavaScript on JavaScript on JavaScript on JavaScript to let someone screw up because they put a div in the wrong place or they made a class name the wrong thing. So um, I hope this encourages you to check out web components, if not anything else I ever do, because I think they're way more consequential than any of the other platforms I've worked on. But uh, if anyone has any questions, we have a few minutes still. Yep. So Brian, this is, uh, I'm just going to follow you around and go to every talk you give, and eventually I'll understand everything that you're saying. But it's 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 uh, I'm starting to get it a little bit, and um, I'm starting to be convinced. Um, but I, then I went and checked and saw how many Chinese students I have in my MOOCs, and I have 28,000 Chinese students. And what I was wondering as you were talking is, it, is there any kind of super backwards compatibility thing where in the server you resolve all this stuff and it just sort of says HTML only version of this thing that because you could really look at all this stuff and you could import it and eventually it does turn into HTML it just happens to do it in the shadow DOM is there any is there any movement to have some kind of radically backwards compatibility server based includes thing to merge all this stuff together so prior to two days ago I would have told you I'd have no idea um, I saw an article by Google. Google's concern with this is not your user that doesn't have a compatible browser. Uh, they're, they're compatible, their user without the compatible browser is a search engine. And so they, uh, the, late, the version of Chrome that just went out yesterday, 59 or something, has support for headless Chrome built into it. And there's a whole bunch of articles starting to come out about, okay, a request comes in and then you have Python script that would say, hey, there's a bot viewing this, or hey, you check that, that browser thing, and then invoke headless Chrome to process the page server side, and then deliver that as the HTML, so that you would basically still get the same. That's a lot more work <laughs> than, than what we described. Um, the other thing is uh, I've seen people basically build, build, start to skin and build things out for a mode that is obviously a lot less interactive, but still works, and then basically treat the elements as progressive enhancement kind of a thing. Oh, someone not Chuck, sweet. <laughs> Great presentation. I came for the H5P, and I didn't get any H5P.org. Uh, you want to comment on what they're using, what they're good or not good for? Oh, uh, yeah, I love H5P. Um, sorry, I didn't know I had to put that in there. But um, yeah, so H5P.org is a really cool um, just kind of widget builder almost. So you can build like little flashcard apps and things like that. It's in HTML5. I feel like if they were to re-architect what they're doing, they would basically be doing something more similar to this. Um, they basically made a way of interpreting .h5p files that then you can author through the browser. Um, is your concern accessibility with them, or are you just? <laughs> um, uh, as uh, there are accessibility concerns associated with H5P because not all of the elements have hit 508 yet. 
But um, what we're doing is we'll have like an interactive video type. And so the interactive video is like pop, um, VH1 pop-up video type of stuff from forever ago. But then we'll have a button that appears before it that's click here for the, the, the less interactive form of this or more accessible type of a thing that if you hit that, it basically reloads it as just the video and then just the questions that are used in it kind of a thing. So we kind of plan around that. I see time's up, so I'll talk to Chuck afterwards. But thank you. Thank you all for coming.